Take it away, Mason. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for the uh, for the introduction, and it's great to be back uh, with the Natural History Society of Maryland. You guys have always been a uh, a wonderful group, which has very much helped me going going forward uh, in paleontology and, and just a uh, just a wonderful group of people. So uh, I'm very glad to to be here. Let's see, so I'm hoping that's showing up on the screen. All right. Yep, we can see it looks good. Great. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be talking about my summer amongst the mammoths. So those of you who uh, have been part of the Natural History Society of Maryland for a while uh, probably know that it that uh, I was supposed to be back over the summer uh, hanging out with you guys. Uh, I've been I've been part of it for a while, um, but then the summer came and I was nowhere to be found. And this is the reason for that. I was uh, I decided to spend my summer amongst the mammoths. So, uh, first, a little bit about me. If you don't know me, uh, I was born and raised in Carroll County, Maryland, uh, in Mount Airy, and uh, I always thought science was super cool. And eventually, uh, I had decided after going fossil hunting with a uh, a teacher of mine, a middle school teacher actually, right at the end of my my tenure at middle school, um, that thought fossil hunting was really cool. And then I took a course on human evolution and decided that human evolution was just the coolest mashup of all the sciences. And so I wanted to study uh, human and primate evolution. Um, and so to pursue these goals, uh, I first joined with the Calvert Marine Museum, which I'm sure uh, many of you know and love. It's a wonderful institution down in Calvert County, Maryland, which studies the Miocene fossils. So about 14 million year old fossils uh, from along the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, from the, from a time in which it was covered with water, with everything from giant sharks to seals, um, and that was a really great experience working with them, uh, find uh, excavating dolphin skeletons, working with the National Park Service with them, and then also working with the dive team at the Calvert Marine Museum uh, to recover some really cool fossils. Um, but unfortunately, in Maryland, there's not uh, anywhere that's got a a, a very robust um, undergraduate program in uh, the study of human evolution. Um, but there's a very good one in Long Island, New York, uh, uh, a four hour drive. Uh, and so I decided that I was going to apply for there when I went to undergraduates, uh, when, I, when it came time to go to college. Um, and so I, I decided to go there and study, pursue anthropology and human evolutionary biology. Anthropology is this, the study of humans and human variation, uh, whereas human evolutionary biology is specifically the study of human evolution. Um, and this is not a super easy field to go into, as you might imagine. Um, it is not a it is not a, a field with lots of jobs and everything. Um, and so, in order to make yourself ready for graduate school and then uh, further on for your career, uh, you are really, they're really looking for a lot of very well-rounded people these days. Um, so they're looking for people who not only can do field work, so going out and finding the fossils, like I was doing at the Calvert Marine Museum, and like I'll be doing this coming summer uh, when I go out to Kenya. Uh, to study the fossil primates or to look for fossil primates there. Um, they want to see that you have outreach skills so you can use social media and other things and get people in the door. Uh, I had done a lot of different uh, social media campaigns at, at that point already, so I was pretty good on that. Um, and then they want to see that you can do education. Uh, a lot of people who go into this field end up as professors or in museums or in other educational settings. Um, and it's good to be able to not only do research, but Tell people what that actually means so that it actually has an application to you know society. And um, I had started playing with that a little bit uh, by going to the uh, by helping out with a uh, small private school in uh, Sri Lanka where they have after school programs uh, for kids so they can learn uh, about all sorts of different things. Uh, but uh, they asked me if I might speak on um, on the the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. And after I did that, uh, they asked if I could maybe help them build a curriculum for a summer class. So I had finished that up on in my second uh, my second semester of my freshman year at Stony Brook University. Um, I also joined the Functional Morphology Lab, uh, where I'm actually currently sitting at this moment, uh, where we study how primate and early human um, bones and teeth, the the form of them, the shape of them, relates to their function. Um, so I had some research down as well. Um, but I did not have much education. I only had that, that little bit with the Knox Salon Institute. But that being said, the summer was approaching and I thought, you know, it would be nice to go back home in Maryland and, you know, work at the local Weiss Market, get to see all my old friends and hang out with you guys at the Natural History Society. But then I was told by a friend of mine, no, 
uh, so a friend of mine who's a graduate student here at Stony Brook said, if you want to really be you know, a competitive candidate for graduate school, you really don't want to waste a summer uh, by doing something that is not, not related to your field uh, when you could, when there's lots of opportunities to get paid, uh, basically doing things that are going to help you in your career. And the one that he suggested to me, one that he had utilized, uh, was the mammoth site of Hot Springs, South Dakota. Um, unfortunately for me, the deadline has passed, but fortunately for me, they had extended it. Um, they have offered three internships at the time, although it turned out this one was a lie. They didn't really have an average internship, but they thought they were going to offer it. But they did have research internships and education internships. In the research internship, basically what they're doing is they're having uh, the interns that come in will be studying the bones of the mammoth, digging in the mammoth site itself, and they will also be 3D scanning uh, the bones there and digitizing them so that they can be used by researchers around the world and printing out 3D prints of them, uh, either A, really tiny ones to sell in the gift shop uh, to keep the, the whole operation afloat, or to send it out or to send out to researchers uh, around the world as well uh, so they can study the bones and uh, doing various other research related tasks at the mammoth site. Whereas the education internship is there, our job was to basically teach the visitors and anyone else who might come uh, what the site means and say what happened here, why is it important? And so that was our job. And that is something that I had, I needed more uh, experience in. So that was the one I decided to pursue. And uh, I said yes to this, not only because I thought it'd be good for my career, it's definitely good for my curriculum vitae or my CV, basically the academic resume, um, but it's also good because it provided free housing for me and a measly $12.50 an hour income, uh, which is something that uh, it's not bad to have when most things you, most opportunities you have to pay for. So it was nice to actually be paid in return for my services, as well as being given a place to live. Um, plus, uh, it, was, it would be cool to go out and live in a different place for a little bit. Um, so from Stony Brook University, uh, it turns out my family wanted to see, go out west and see what that was like out there. So we decided to take an absolutely massive road trip because I had to get all the stuff out of my dorm anyway. So after my family did, was very kind and all the way up from Maryland to pick me at Stony Brook University, we took a 1,810 mile trip to Hot Springs, South Dakota. Along the way, I saw such natural wonders as the uh, sand dunes on the shores of Lake Michigan and the jolly green giant of Blue Earth, Minnesota, which is rather large. There's me for comparison. And uh, the world's one and only corn palace of Mitchell, South Dakota, um, which was certainly a sight to behold. Uh, and so uh, that after 28 hours, you eventually arrive in Hot Springs, South Dakota, in the southwestern corner of South Dakota. And uh, before I go forward, it's very important to kind of know what's what, what formed South Dakota. Obviously, it's just a piece of land that humans have put a border around, but it's a very interesting place for a few reasons. Uh, as you can, this is something called a geologic map. It's basically something that shows the sediments underneath your feet, how old they are. Um, and as you can see, here is the Missouri River. And on the eastern side of it, it's very homogenous. There's basically just one color there. Um, and on the other side, it looks like someone threw a paint can at, at, at the map. So on this side, what had happened actually was that glaciers at one point had come by at the, at the end of, or at the last glacial ma maximum, the last ice age. The glaciers have come and basically sliced off the top of the land, revealing only one layer. It's very flat. Um, this is part of the Great Plains, right? Um, and this right here is uh, mostly from the, uh, the earlier part of the late Cretaceous and the mid Cretaceous, and it is uh, the remains of the Western Interior Seaway, a great ocean which covered the, in, the middle part of the United States um, at that time. And so in these rocks are, or in these sediments rather, it's, it's actually pretty uh, unconsolidated for the most part, um, there are fossils of things like giant sea lizards called, uh, called mosasaurs, there are ammonites, there are fossil sharks, lots of things like that. Um, but this land being very flat lends itself to uh, growing crops, uh, things like corn and wheat and other things. And so that's the type of industry that is very common in this part of South Dakota. South Dakota is a, not a very densely populated state. There are very few people there. Um, but what people that are here are mostly farmers, except for people who live towards the city, uh, Sioux Falls down there. When you go to the Western side of the state, um, it's very different. The glaciers have not carved off the top. So instead of being very flat, it's extremely hilly. Um, and most of it has been, you can see the rivers have worn it down. And so you have uh, 
kind of difference in topography there. Uh, the stuff on top, uh, indicated by this color, uh, is stuff from the time. It is stuff from the end of the time of the dinosaurs, the uh, the late Cretaceous, and it is actually land deposits around here, uh, around the Cheyenne uh, River Native American uh, reservation, was where Sue the T Rex, one of the most complete T Rexes of all time, was discovered. Um, and but as you go down to these lower elevation places, it's other stuff from the Western Interior Seaway. So when this place was covered with water, and you have all those marine fossils. Um, and in this this half of South Dakota and the people there, even they, they have kind of, you know, a friendly rivalry going on. There's people who are, you know, east of river and west of river people. Uh, they have a very different culture kind of going on. Um, and on this part, uh, there's more pe there's more uh, more ranching and herding, um, a pastoralist lifestyle, we might say. Uh, there's a lot of cows and, of course, the iconic bison, which are kind of becoming a more agricultural animal uh, rather than just a natural part of the landscape down here. Uh, instead of all these uh, very old Cretaceous um, ocean deposits are actually much younger. They're from after the time of the dinosaurs, from the reign of the mammals, as we might call it, the Cenozoic. And that is actually mostly volcanic material, ash and uh, ash that's been redistributed. Um, and that has a lot of very cool fossils in it. This is the White River Group, which you fossil hunters may have heard of. And those of you who are not fossil hunters know this as the Badlands um, of South Dakota. And in this, there are a lot of really cool fossils um, and it's a very, very interesting landscape and there's not an incredible amount of vegetation. Um, it's a very cool place to see. But over here, there's kind of like a giant blister or a giant popped pimple of, in the land, uh, which is the Black Hills. And that is where Hot Springs is. So let's zoom in on that real quick. So this is what it looks like. Um, and this area, this uh, raised area with a, a small kind of mountain range in the middle, um, the Black Hills formed around, started to form around 65 million years ago with something called the Laramide orogeny. Um, that is an event which basically uh, there was one uh, one plate which went down and under, and one plate that was over the the the, one, the plate that is most of America. And um, when that one was sliding over under, it scrunched up the land and created mountains, most notably the Rocky Mountains, which you probably know a little better and are a lot bigger. But in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, we have the Black Hills, uh, which rose up. Uh, so it basically took everything was layered flat like a layer cake, uh, but the stuff in, on the bottom rose up in the middle and came up. But over time, erosion happened. So what was once you know a big hill uh, basically was cut off the top. And so what you're left with is the oldest stuff being in the middle and it getting progressively younger as you go out. So if you look at cross section of this, and right here is where Hot Springs is, um, where the Mammoth site is, we can kind of get an idea of the types of rocks uh, that create the Black Hills. In the core, there's granite. This granite is not the oldest stuff. It's actually the oldest stuff is the schist, which surrounds it. Um, but the granite rose up uh, as the, it was basically a, a magma chamber that cooled. That's what granite is. Um, and this granite actually forms Mount Rushmore and all of the other large, uh, basically, mountains in the area. Um, it's a very tough rock, so it, it takes a long time to erode. Around that is the schist. Uh, the schist it used to be shale or basically hardened mud, um, but the, the heat of this granite, which used to be magma rising through it, and the pressure of the, this mountain building event uh, turned it, crystallized it basically, and cycled schist, a very flaky, delicate rock. And then above that, we have the remains of an ancient ocean from before the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, this is called limestone. It's actually composed of the the, skeleton, the uh, exoskeleton of marine microorganisms. Um, and uh, so it's, it's kind of like chalk. Chalk is a type of limestone that's pretty high grade. And then on top of this limestone is shale. Uh, shale is, as I said before, is basically hardened mud. This particular shale is called spearfish shale after a town of the northern part of the Black Hills, uh, which is on top of the spearfish shale. And this spearfish shale so forms something called the red race track that goes all the way around the Black Hills, or here it's called the Red Valley, but they usually call it the Red Racetrack. Um, it's red because of the iron oxides in it, and it actually came from the shore of a Triassic Ocean, so from before, uh, for, from the first period of the dinosaurs, um, but there are no fossils in it. Uh, the limestone does have some marine fossils in it, but if you look right here, the man site is actually positioned right on top of a lip of limestone that goes on top of, or a lip of shale that goes on top of the limestone. So there's a thin layer of limestone or a thin layer of shale uh, and lots of limestone underneath it. 
and that is the conditions which create the mammoth site. So what does that look like? That looks like this, uh, basically, if we're at the place uh, called the mammoth site. Now, you might have noticed that the town is called Hot Springs. The reason for that is because the water table is pretty high there. Uh, it's filled with water, and that water has been heated by all that geothermic, uh, ge all that, uh, that, uh, that geologically active activity. Um, and so that there is actually a slightly, it's, it's not really that hot. Um, if, if you can go to the local rivers there and, and, and put your feet in it, uh, but it, it's, it's kind of warm and it stays warm during the winter. Uh, and, that, and at different points in time, the temperature is probably fluctuated. So basically this limestone is submerged or is, is saturated with water and then there's shale above it. Now limestone like chalk is basically composed, you know, of those exoskeletons, which are created of calcium carbonate, the same stuff that is, uh, makes up like tums that you might use when you know you have a little bit of an acid problem. So when, just like when you eat the tums uh, and it goes into your stomach, it neutralizes with the acid and dissolves away. Um, just like that, this water, which can become slightly acidic due to rain, um, it could be hot spring water, will actually dissolve the limestone, creating fissures underneath the shale. And after a while, you might be able to guess what happens. That shale will crumble and form what is called a sinkhole. And Frederick, Maryland, this, can, this is actually a pretty big problem because there's limestone underneath Frederick, Maryland, and it often dissolves and creates uh, sinkholes, um, although the top layer there is just dirt and not shale, um, depending on where you are in Frederick. And so basically, throughout uh, this red race track, there are several um, sinkholes. And the mammoth site is one of these sinkholes. In it, uh, we're not exactly sure on, on the first date it formed. As far as we drilled down, it's about 190,000 years old. Uh, the dating of the site has actually radically changed in recent years due to some uh, some mishaps which, with how it was dated in the beginning. Uh, but the new dating is very solid. So we know uh, that at least it ended around 140,000 years old um, at the topper layers. So um, after this collapse happened, uh, what you have is a steep-sided shale. Um, shale is, again, hardened mud. It's very brittle, and it can get slippery when it's wet. And uh, the limestone underneath. This is what the mammoths would fall into. And eventually, they would be buried. Um, uh, over time, basically, the rain and everything will, uh, will dissolve, uh, not only dissolve the limestone, but have dirt and shale and all their stuff fill it in. Um, and of course, the mammoths will become bones over time, their flesh will rot away, and they will be buried. Um, something that's pretty cool about this is when you dissolve the limestone in that water, right? Now that water is full of calcium carbonate, which, when it evaporates, will be left behind, actually kind of concreting the dirt inside together and making it harder than the, the sediments around it. It's actually much harder than the shale, the stuff inside of it. So when erosion comes around, uh, and, and actually also the water table will go away, uh, and when the, because it, it is actually, like I said, the Black Hills are actually still rising. So they were rising, the water is left behind. Uh, but the, uh, the sediment which filled the, the sinkhole is actually going to remain uh, higher than the shale, which is going to erode quicker. So if you'll notice there, the shale went down, whereas the fill did not, leaving a hill, which might be counterintuitive. You know, you, it was a sinkhole before, but now it's a hill. Um, and this is what it looked like. It was just an inconspicuous little hill when, uh, when people arrived. And um, eventually, uh, there was a land developer who wanted to build a, 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 a basically a large retirement community there. Um, and the hill was, uh, you know, it was just a local landmark. People used to play baseball on top of it. Uh, but they said that was unsightly and they wanted to remove so they could build more houses there. So in came the bulldozers, which of course ran into a mammoth. At first, they thought it was one mammoth, but uh, and they brought in uh, Dr. Larry Agenbrod from Shattuck State about uh, a few hours south um, to excavate it. And after they excavated the first mammoth, they hit another mammoth, and then another, and then another, and then another. And eventually, he said to the land developer, basically, dude, we got to either dig up all these mammoths, or, or basically, we have to preserve the site, or we can build over it. And it's, it's your choice. It's your land, right? Um, and uh, the, the land developer said, well, how, how are you gonna preserve it? And his idea uh, was to build a museum directly on top of it rather than take away all the bones. Um, and to, this, to you know, in a very happy turn of events, the, the land developer was actually quite kind and decided to sell the land at cost back to a new nonprofit created by the town in order to preserve the site. 
Um, so he lost quite a bit of money on the deal, uh, but uh, or potential money on the deal. But uh, a a the uh, there was basically a museum that was built around the entirety of the sinkhole. So now paleontologists can work year round excavating it in uh, air conditioning and heat, and also the public can come see the entire site and the mammoths as they were when they fell in. So this is what the, the culmination of that event looks like. Uh, these are just two pictures from various, various parts in the pit um, where you can see lots of different mammoths. You can see right here, this is a tusk. This is actually one that was sliced off originally by the bulldozers. Um, and then here's the skull, here's the mandible, so the lower jaw. Um, here is, you know, one of the arms, shoulder blade, rib cage, uh, down there looks like the pelvis. Um, and this right here is uh, Beauty, uh, one of the mammoths. This is, this is the pelvis and the, the, uh, the, lower, the upper legs of Napoleon, one of the most complete mammoths there. Most of the mammoths, a lot of the mammoths have names. Appears Beast. Uh, these two guys were preserved with different types of preservative, which is why this one's beauty, because it was modern preservatives, very nice. This one was excavated a lot earlier and has basically become discolored because of the preservatives they were put, that were put on it. Um, so it's called beauty, or it's called beast. Um, but there's basically, in short, over 50 mammoths uh, in the site. I believe, I believe it's 64 mammoths in the site now. Um, don't quote me on that. It's always changing uh, because they're always finding more. So what fossils do we find there? Obviously, there's the mammoths, right? Um, which are a majority of the mammal fossils that are found there are mammoths. Um, there's actually two species of mammoths there. A lot of people don't know, but there's, there's actually many different species of mammoths. But in this region, we have mainly two, uh, the woolly mammoth and the Columbian mammoth. You probably heard of the woolly mammoth. Uh, they're actually a little bit smaller, and they are covered with thick mats of uh, wool, uh, or not of wool, but of fur. And we know this because we have found large amounts of their fur and, and basically mummified mammoths uh, across the permafrost. Um, Colombian mammoths, uh, or woolly mammoths rather, are actually a very small proportion of what are found at the site. Uh, I believe there's around three to four that we know are there. Um, Colombian mammoths, look a lot like elephants, but massive. They're truly ginormous creatures up to 40 feet high. Um, and when you walk into the mammoth site, there's a giant, you know, a statue of a mammoth, uh, of a Colombian mammoth. And mostly when the kids come in, they say, no, that is not a mammoth, that is an elephant. And the, the kids are right. Uh, mammoths are actually more closely related to Asian, or Asian elephants are more closely related to mammoths than Asian elephants are to African elephants. So mammoths are just a type of elephant. Um, they're just a group of elephants. Uh, and these Colombian mammoths are known from the more southerly portions of the New World. So basically they're known from uh, the, the bottom part of Canada all the way down into, uh, into Central America. And so uh, woolly mammoths are more northerly distributed. They're found across Eurasia, the, the northern part of Eurasia, as well as the northern part of North America. And where the mammoth site is, is a very interesting place where their, their ranges overlap. Um, although most of the mammoths here are Colombian. Uh, we actually know from DNA evidence that they would hybridize occasionally, so they could produce fertile offspring. So those are the mammoths that we find at the mammoth site. But those aren't the only things we find. There's other large herbivores as well. This includes camels, uh, large camels called like this. Uh, camelops is found there. Camels actually evolved in North America. Some of the oldest ones are actually found at the Badlands site, which is quite a bit older than the mammoth site. Um, so at Badlands, we find camels, um, and here we find camels. There is some living ca uh, camelids in North, or rather in South America today, and those are the alpacas and the llamas. We have one relative of them also at the mammoth site, hemiarachnia, um, one type of, of extinct llama. And we actually have uh, a fossil from something that still lives in the Black Hills today. Uh, the the pronghorn or the uh, American antelope, uh, which is not actually an antelope, but uh, is a very, very fast and very, very iconic uh, creature, which has lived there here the entire time. There's also some carnivores, which of course catches the eye. Uh, there are gray wolves, oops. There are gray wolves, um, coyotes. There are badgers. And there are black-footed ferrets. Uh, or we believe them to be black-footed ferrets or some sort of ferret, um, and which are a very endangered species there today, uh, but they tend to feed on you know, prairie dogs and such. And the most iconic creature there, the giant short-faced bear, the second largest bear to ever live. Uh, and there are two individuals of that, one probably male and one probably female. 
um, and including one very nice skull, one of the nicest skulls ever found from a giant short-faced bear, um, or Ar Arctotus simus, as it's known scientifically. Uh, one thing that everyone always asks when they come there are, where are the saber-toothed tigers? And the answer is, we don't know. We don't have any saber-toothed tigers. So either they weren't there or they didn't fall in and didn't die. Uh, so we don't have any of those yet, but they're still digging year-round every year. So who knows? Maybe we'll have saber-toothed tigers later. Um, apart from that, there's a plethora of small animals and uh, and and other things which are found at the mammoth site, including fish, which is kind of crazy. Uh, the water that fed the, the mammoth site when it was a sinkhole, a uh, water-filled sinkhole, um, was A, we know from the snails, which we found in there, around 90 degrees uh, of temperature. Uh, and from the fact that the mammoths could, uh, there's some mammoth footprints in there, which is preserved, which is really cool. We know it's around 40 feet deep at least. Or, or it would have been at least around 40 feet deep when they stepped in it because that's the maximum height of mammoths. So if they're walking in it, they must have had a little bit above the water. Um, but uh, it is not connected to any outside water streams. So these fish must have gotten there when it rained and connected briefly uh, to nearby rivers such as the Fall River. Uh, so somehow fish managed to get in there uh, and, and live in there. Um, there's prairie dogs, which are very common throughout the Great Plains and the Black Hills today, a very cool, lovely little animal, and many other little tiny fossils, which the uh, research interns spent a large part of their day picking through the little bits of dirt for the little tiny fossils from these guys. But the question is, why in the world are there so many mammoths at the mammoth site? Uh, why are they so common? Why are they more common than anything else? Um, what was killing them, basically? So to solve this mystery, we have to know a few things. First, we know that the spring that fed this would have been around 90 degrees year round. We know that all of the mammoths that are found in the site are male. Every single one is male. We know this from uh, the, uh, the pelvis shape, pretty much, and from the, rob the robustness of the bones. We know that they were mostly young adults. We know this from their teeth, um, which, uh, which set of teeth they're on and how worn down the set of tooth that they have is. Uh, can tell us the age of the animal, and most of them are young adults. Not all of them, but most of them are young adults. Um, and then we have to know a little bit about modern elephant behavior, which acts as a pretty good modern an or a good analog for uh, mammoth behavior. Um, and you know, we have lots of bits of research that kind of confirm that they were pretty similar to elephants in a lot of ways. Um, one way is that they were probably matriarchal, so they were led by an older female, uh, basically, you know, in a herd. And the older female, the or elephants as a whole, are very intelligent creatures. They're very good at communicating, so they can pass on information very well. But around the time when they reach adolescence, they are kicked. At, the males specifically get too rambunctious, so they are kicked out of the herd. Uh, and then when they reach young adulthood, they are roaming around looking for more territory. During that time, they don't have a matriarch telling them what where are good good places to go and where are bad places to go, because um, they don't have that, that you know cultural transmission. So uh, they, make, they make decisions that they don't know are bad. One of those bad decisions is going to a sinkhole, which has uh, green vegetation growing around it, even in the depths of winter, because it's 90 degrees. So it's very attractive to a young male elephant who's very hungry. Um, and they didn't know that the steep shale uh, lips, which are slippery and brittle, uh, are liable to give way underneath a very heavy mammoth. Um, and so these unfortunate uh, mammoths would basically be go going there for a little, a little snack and they would slip in and fall. And mammoths do not have hands, so they could not get out uh, like many other animals probably had a chance of doing. Um, they were basically stuck there until they starved and, uh, and then their bones were left on the bottom. This probably wasn't a lot of mammoths a year. Uh, they're distributed throughout the sequence. So we know that they were dying. It was a few mammoths a year probably. Um, we've only drilled down 50 feet, and there's mammoth bone all the way down, so it could go a lot further. Um, and what we have drilled has been dated to 140 to 190,000 years old through a technique called optically stimulated luminescence, OSL. So that's why there's a ton of mammoths here, which is kind of cool because it's like the opposite of the La Brea site, uh, which you might know from Southern California, um, which is basically uh, a tar pit where basically maybe a few mammoths would get stuck in their ear. And then the saber-toothed cats and the dire wolves, especially dire wolves, were uh, are, are the most common mammal there. Um, 
would basically try to eat that, uh, that mammoth that got stuck in there and then they would get stuck. So that's a predator trap. Ours is kind of the opposite. It's a large herbivore trap, which is very cool. So the question for me, because I was an education intern, not a researcher, is how do we effectively educate the public on this? One way they did this was they had, uh, when we first got there in the beginning of the summer, some schools were still running. So we had some school groups come in and we did little classes with them. But for the majority of the summer, we were doing other things. Uh, one of the things is we had little science shows out in the morning where basically I'd take a cart uh, with different educational resources, including Bone Crusher Bob, a metal reconstruction of the giant short-faced bear, uh, to teach kids, you know, fairly common basic uh, science principles. Uh, for example, simple machines. You know, you've got uh, you've got a lever, you've got wedges, things like that. There's also an interactive education room they've had built. Uh, one thing they have here is a sandbox uh, filled with uh, sand, um, and they have a augmented reality projector which has a sensor on it. Um, which, however you move the sand, it will basically create a little topographic map on it, uh, you know, showing you what the high peaks are and what the low peaks are. And then, like this little girl has uh, so uh, deftly done, is created rain. You can put your hand over it and release it, and rain comes out, and it follows the contours. So you can learn a little bit about how water moves throughout a landscape. Another way that this is done is by a large stream table, in which recycled pa uh, plastic pellets are, uh, are, play are in the thing. And there's water streaming through, and there are various little figurines, including extinct uh, mammals and other things, that can show you how the water can carve through the landscape and how different landscapes affect uh, the water and how the water affects the landscape. So it's a very cool educational thing for little kids, plus it's fun. Um, and if you couldn't find an intern, they were probably playing in that. We also had dig classes, which took up a majority of our time. Um, where basically we would teach kids or uh, kids and their families to uh, dig like paleontologists. The way we did this are basically we have really giant sandboxes uh, that are some 25 feet long, three feet deep, um, filled with sediment that we actually took from the site. So when they take, when they dig things up, you know, there's dirt. And after they sift through it, they just have the dirt. So what do they do with it? They take it out to the giant sandbox and they put it in it. Um, in that giant sandbox, we would bury large exact 3D replicas um, of the mammoth bones themselves. And we would uh, bury them in there, pack it down. And then they use the exact same tools, uh, literally literally the exact same tools that the research interns and the paleontologists there use to excavate the mammoths. And uh, basically they dig for the bones and then they try to identify the bones and we give them resources on that. Uh, we have a little spiel at the beginning telling them about the site and they usually have an absolute blast. Uh, there's an easier one here, which is usually just kids uh, for this promotional photograph. They have parents in there, but parents were usually, you know, if, if they wanted help, we usually let them in. Um, and then there was, there's another, uh, there's an, another uh, more complicated one over at the corner, uh, which has, uh, which you also map where you find the fossils. A lot of fossils are like in real life broken. Uh, so you can find pieces of them and you have to identify the broken ones. Um, and they also did, we also did a plaster jacketing demonstration. So this was really cool, really popular. One of the things we, we told them never to do is to pick up the bones and, and, and move them around and, uh, and, and place them up like this. Of course, it's always a challenge getting uh, small children to listen to you. But, uh, and one reason for that was just because we have to bury them afterwards. And so we'd have to rebury the old giant six foot mammoth humor again, uh, but also because paleontologists don't wanna move around bones. As mentioned in the beginning, context is important, not just in archeology, span but in paleontology. It tells us how old something is and where it is in relation to other animals that have died in the region. So uh, it's, you know, one of the simple things we can teach them. So this is what it looks like after they've, you know, dug through it. And as fellow intern Charlotte here is showing, uh, we would basically bury them afterwards, uh, which took quite a while and a lot of work. And after we did the plaster jacketing demonstration, we we're all very dirty, covered with plaster and dirt that is plastered to us. Uh, but basically, the families would get to take home a plaster jacket that's shaped in the bone, uh, in the shape of the bone that they uncovered. Apart from this, uh, when we had free time, we'd be going out and doing rove carts. Uh, rove carts were just little carts filled with educational resources uh, that were created by interns in year, years past um, to help educate the kids. Uh, this is Maddie, another uh, intern that was there with me. And uh, she was a geology major, so she was teaching kids about rocks uh, with lots of different rocks. Um, and then you see the kids find it very interesting. They like seeing them and playing with them and, and doing all the different tests that geologists do to figure out what type of rock they have. 
Um, but uh, we actually were positioned around the pit. And uh, this is not just for kids, adults love this too, people of all ages, uh, everyone has something to learn and everyone has a little bit of them that wants to touch everything in the museum, which allowed us to do it. Uh, the cart that I usually took out uh, was what was originally a small fossils cart, but our, my supervisor made the terrible mistake of leaving me alone in the educational resources room, and I grabbed a bunch of large fossils and shoved them on top. Um, and I did that for most of the summer, including some fossils that I had brought, brought along with me, like this dolphin rib that I had found in Virginia. Uh, and there's a megalodon tooth. I didn't bring it along, but you know, it calls back to my, um, my days hunting fossil sharks in Maryland. There's also a piece of mammoth bone from the site so that so that people can actually, you know, touch and handle the bones that are coming out of the site and feel a real connection to it, as well as a real mammoth tooth. Um, so that people can learn about that and learn how mammoth teeth are replaced. And a very popular item was this, uh, these, this brain endocast, so basically the cranium of a creature which has been filled with mud and gives us basically an idea of what their brain looked like. Um, and this is from an oridont found at the Badlands not far away from the site. So uh, that was always great to interact with the public. But every intern also had to have an independent project. What I did, because I am an anthropology major, I study human evolution and primate evolution, was I created basically a giant, a giant online drive filled with resources of anything they could ever need relating to human evolution. Because the site formed 140 to 190,000 years ago, there are no humans at the site. Uh, humans probably came into North America around 20,000 years ago, probably a little before that. Um, but uh, our site, you know, predates that from by, you know, 160,000 years. So uh, they would not have humans there, but the animals that, uh, that are at the mammoth site are the mammal or the animals that the first humans in North America would have encountered. Uh, so it's very important and there's a lot of human heritage around there. So I created things like little graphs that tell you, you know, how the living apes are related to each other, including humans. Um, got them 3D scans of skulls of human ancestors and human relatives, and made little diagrams on how stone tools have been made by ancient peoples. Note on stone tools, so there's actually an exhibit hall along with the, uh, the, the mammoth site. Um, and one thing is that nearby uh, sites that are much younger do have evidence of humans butchering mammoths, including creating giant cleavers out of uh, the mammoth scapula shoulder blade, and basically using that to crack into mammoth lung bones and get to the marrow inside. Um, and uh, there are things called Clovis points. Clovis points are a type of uh, projectile point uh, that are very large and great for taking down large animals like this. And how do they take them down? By something uh, called an atlatl or a spear thrower. Um, and this is a very cool piece of equipment which we could teach to the visitors. We also had atlatl classes, my favorite, personal favorite thing to teach by looking at the beautiful Seven Sisters Mountain, um, which has you know, seven peaks, uh, we would uh, throw these spears or darts, uh, which are pretty long, they're like five feet long, um, with the atlatl, which is basically a stick with a hook or a swoop at the end that you put it in, and there's a particular way you throw it. And this is what a lot of the, project the early projectile points were actually attached to, rather than bows and arrows, though it depends where you are and what time. Um, and this was always super fun. Uh, it was always a big hit. This is actually my dad and my brother, um, but uh, they came around at the end and I got to teach them how to do it. Um, it was popular across age groups, as you might imagine, um, from the little kids all the way up until the adults. Uh, but there's, you know, very stringent safety concerns, which we had to manage uh, as part of the job, as well as, you know, communicating them why this is important. Some of the kids got pretty good at it, and you got, you know, some some kids uh, did the Robin Hood sort of thing where they they, they got it through the the, uh, the fletchings of the other arrow. Um, it takes some effort uh, to figure out how to to work your muscles around it because it's, it's not a supernatural motion, considering that a lot of people did baseball growing up, which is a little different. Um, but once you get the hang of it, it is very strong and very accurate. Uh, allowing you to, allowing early, or allowing ancestral humans to take down mammoths, uh, allowing some modern humans who still use it today to take down uh, seals and kangaroos and all sorts of things, depending on where they are. Uh, I don't like to call these primitive technologies because they're not primitive. They're just a different way of doing things and they're still used today. Um, but we would throw them at different uh, animals that are found at the mammoth site, the giant short-faced bear, the camels, the coyotes, and the llamas. Um, and it's always great when, when one sinks in. Speaking of projectile points and what we call lithics or stone tools, um, I 
knew that I was going to be taking a stone tool class, which I am doing currently. Um, I knew I'd be doing it in the following spring. And I had some free time at the end of the day and always uh, was, uh, there's lots of rocks around of the type that were used to make stone tools. And I thought, why don't I give, my, give it a try to learn how to do this? Uh, this is called flint napping. Um, although you're not always napping flint, uh, you could be napping all sorts of materials. And uh, eventually after a lot of trial and error and stealing a book from my supervisor, I learned how to do this uh, in, in a few different styles, including a modern human style to make things like this arrowhead, uh, all the way back to the style of, of uh, ancient human species like Homo erectus, this is a hand axe. And eventually people started, the other interns started seeing me doing this and said, hey, why don't you teach me? That looks pretty fun. So I had a sort of impromptu uh, you know, stone tool class going on. Um, and then when my supervisor came by and saw us, said, hey, why don't you go out front and do this in front of the mammoth site so that when visitors walk in, they can see you doing it. They know it's a pretty cool thing. Their kids can come or they can come and they can ask questions about what you're doing or watch you. Um, and you could use that as an opportunity to teach them to you know, make it a, a more fleshed out educational experience. So that's exactly what I did during the, the dog days of the summer at the end. I was making stone tools of the different uh, types made by different uh, pre-human and then eventually human species uh, throughout uh, the world. And all the while learning how to make stone tools, which was super fun. Something that's cool about this is there's a nearby site uh, called the Boar Buffalo Jump, which I got to visit towards the end of my stay there. Um, we're basically the Native Americans of the region. This is actually post Christopher Columbus, but before there was a lot of, uh, a lot of white people in the area. Um, the Native Americans would herd the buffalo, the giant herds of buffalo, like there used to be back in those days, into a different sinkhole. Uh, like I said, there's a few of these sinkholes around, and they would basically cause them to stampede and, 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 and jump into the sinkhole, uh, the, the sinkhole to their death. Um, and this actually happened a total of, I believe, 22 times. We have, uh, it's all very layered, uh, so we know what it is. And then they have the stone tools along with them. And something that was pretty cool for me to see was uh, this hand axe here, a lot like the early human one, though different in some very crucial aspects, but that's a, a story for a different time. Uh, but very similar to what I was making, uh, they were using to either use as itself or probably more likely to get the flakes off of this to cut um, the, to butcher all of these, these bison that they had just uh, run into this uh, buffalo drum. And they would take the meat and that would be, get them through the very tough, harsh winters of the uh, of the Great Plains and Black Hills, um, where it's it's not as easy to grow things, um, and it's really cool for me as someone who who really primarily studies bones uh, to see these the the types of fractures that only come from you know things falling from large heights, uh, which bison don't tend to do because they don't tend to climb trees. So something that's very important to know here is that the Black Hills are indigenous land. Uh, there were lots of people who would come up to me while I was making stone tools who were of indigenous descent and would give me tips because they still do it today. Um, a lot of people, uh, they still know how to make uh, stone tools. And um, this, this area is unique in that uh, it was inhabited by lots of people, most recently the Lakota people. Um, and it is a very sacred region to them. Um, in, the 1868, in an 1868 treaty, which the US government forced upon them, uh, they were actually granted the Black Hills forever, in perpetuity, that was supposed to be their land. But within a decade, the US government broke the deal and unilaterally, unilaterally stole the land. Um, and in 1890, hundreds of civilian men, women, and children were killed at Wounded Knee. Um, so there's been an incredible amount of historic mistreatment and indigenous people continue to be uh, one of the un most underserved populations in the United States today, despite this being their ancestral land. So it's good to not only teach about their, their heritage there and the history of uh, their people there, uh, which we tried to do, um, but also to recognize that they're still around today and uh, you should always be doing what you can to help support them. Um, and a note about the land there. So what was it like actually living there in South Dakota? Um, first off, there's hail, which this is pretty normal. You know, I mean, we don't get it that often in Maryland, but you see it every now and then. Something that's not super normal is hail of this size, uh, which we had one night when I had actually gone to give a talk over at a, a, a local state park. Uh, but when I came back, there was all of this hail. And for those of the, those interns who were unfortunate enough to have brought a car, they were all dented up and destroyed by this baseball sized hail. So the, the land there is, is not uh, as, tame as we might think of it in the East Coast. Uh, but 
I mentioned the interns a lot. And one of the best parts of the summer was hanging out with all the interns and doing all the, the fun stuff. Uh, we, all, we were coworkers, we were friends, and we were we all lived together. So it's you really got to like the group of people if you want to get through the summer, uh, okay? Uh, because you're spending 24-7 with them. So playing Foursquare with them is great. Uh, going swimming in the slightly warmer than average river. Um, playing with the, the, the local stray cats and all of the bunnies had different names. And one of the, the, the uh, one of my supervisors, uh, dog, uh, lovely Corgi, and all a lot of the employees brought in their dogs, which were great. Um, going out to different places, seeing the local wildlife, like the iconic bison here at Wind Cave. Uh, also hiking along uh, the thousands of miles of really, I'm not sure it's thousands of miles, but it's a lot of miles of trails that are around there. They're very cool. Doing a little bit of rock climbing around the area. Um, including, this is the top of uh, Little Devil's Tower, giving you basically a beautiful view of the entirety, 360 view of the, uh, the Black Hills and its granite formations. You can even go under the ground at Wind Cave and, and the various other caves around there and see the beautiful box work and other cave formations that exist in the area. And this is also a very sacred site to the Lakota. They believe it to be um, the, the, uh, their creation myth is centered around this place. And so, yeah, so these are all the people I worked with uh, and it was great working with all of them and meeting them and I'm still friends with a lot of them. So that was very cool. So that's basically where I spent my summer. That's why I wasn't in Maryland with you guys. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna be in Kenya uh, in this summer, but if you guys have any questions about my time at the Mammoth site uh, and what I did there, uh, I'm, I'm open to that. Questions, comments? That was awesome, Mason. Unfortunately, you're going to be in Kenya. I feel so yeah. bad for you. <laughs> no, it'll be great. Uh, but I'm, I'm sad I won't be able to spend it with you guys, spend some of you guys. Some uh, question coming in on the chat. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, so as a geology major, I see why they didn't pay much. I'd do it for free if I could. Yes. Uh, it's very hard to find paid internships. Um, and so this is this one. Uh, we actually, when I applied, I thought it was eleven dollars an hour because that's what it said. But they, they bumped up our pay, so that was nice. Uh, that was more than I had ever made it in my life at that point. So I was happy about it, and the free housing was great. Um, so yeah, it was it was uh, it was good from a financial perspective for me. Um, has there been any looking for other sinkholes? That's a great question. Uh, in terms of that, uh, like I said, there's the Vore Buffalo Jump, which is another sinkhole that has that was used in more recent times. Um, but there are there has been looking for other sinkholes, but the problem is they look like a hill uh, when you when you first see them. There's no discernible difference from any other part of the landscape, um, and most hills that you dig up aren't sinkholes. They're just you know places where the, the land is slightly different. So it's very difficult uh, to, to to find other things, and we haven't found another one like this in the area. Um, but who knows, the future could hold more. There could be dozens of mammoth sites throughout the Hot Springs area. Let's see. Uh, Road Scholars, you see, we have the Road Scholars still do it. The Road Scholars came almost every week we'd have a Road Scholars group. Um, and they were lovely people who came in um, and had a great time doing either the, the dig the dig classes uh, or watching the Adelaide demonstrations. Uh, and yeah, they, they always got a blast out of it. Uh, a lot of times they'd bring the grandkids and it would be a wonderful experience. You know, it's great to, it's a good bonding experience for, you know, different generations to be, everyone loves digging. So they always had fun with that. You answered all of the questions uh, before they came up in your comprehensive and informative presentation. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Mason. Really appreciate hey, you taking you. the time to do this. Yeah, I, I thank you guys uh, for having me back. And it, it's been great uh, seeing all of you again. So yeah, thank you very much. Likewise. Take care, everyone. See you next time. My comment would be, if you can go there, go there. It's fabulous. I agree with that.